Hello everyone, this is Earth Science teacher Tim Martin, and in Meteorology Part 23, this is the first video in a series on climate change, how we know what we know about the Earth's climate. In this video, we'll talk briefly about collecting data and paleoclimatology, with a special focus on understanding proxy climate data. To start off with, we know that climate is an average of at least 30 years worth of weather. Some of the best climate records come from places where we have long-term weather observations. I'd like to point out this picture on the left is a journal that was kept by Mr. Thomas Barker in Linden Hall, England. For over 62 years, he recorded the weather and changes in his environment. Another fascinating project is the Old Weather Project. Using the idea that ships document the weather every hour, the Old Weather Project is asking for help in going back examining old ships logs and then taking that information and putting it into modern climate models. I'd encourage you to look up that project at oldweather.org. Another group of historical records may be less obvious. Here's a very famous painting of General George Washington crossing the Delaware River. This supposedly occurred on December 25th in 1776. We know now in late December, the Delaware River is always open and ice free. Seeing the floating ice in this image leads us to believe that maybe climate conditions have changed. Another example is this petroglyph I photographed on a desert wall in the canyon country of Arizona. Here the Native Americans depicted something that looks like a bighorn sheep, leading us to believe that it must have been living in the area at the time these petroglyphs were made. Some other petroglyphs may include images of agriculture and different growing plants. Again, examining these may tell us something about the environment at the time the petroglyphs were carved. Dendrochronology is another tremendously useful way to get climate information when we don't have specific records. Here are two branches from a Virginia pine tree. One of these branches came from the mountains in your Stokes County, North Carolina. Another one came from my backyard in central Guilford County, North Carolina. You can see one clearly had much more favorable growing conditions. The thicker tree rings account for the fact that the tree grew much more quickly under more favorable conditions. From this, we may be able to understand a bit about the climate and the weather in those locations. This can be taken on a much larger scale. Here we can see my family standing beside some of the redwoods out west. This particular slab of redwood tree was cut down in the 1930s. The tree itself lived for over a thousand years. Examining the growth rings, we can see sometimes when the tree was growing in a more favorable environment, producing more wood. Other times when the rings are much closer together and the environment and conditions were less favorable. From this, we may understand some basic climate information. We can do this without cutting the entire tree down using an increment borer. By taking this specialized drill, we can twist it into the trunk of a tree, extract a small sample, and examine the tree rings, finding when it was a favorable time for the tree to be growing. This can be taken to the extreme. This is one of my favorite trees up in the high desert mountains of California. This is a bristlecone pine. Examining the wood bristlecone, we can see that there are as many as five or six annual growth rings per millimeter. This very slow growing tree holds a very long climate record. In fact, this tree is estimated to be in excess of 4,000 years old. Again, looking for the thick growth rings, we can infer a better growing conditions for that tree. Coral may document climate in a similar way. Coral is made out of small creatures that build a shell out of calcium carbonate. When we examine this more carefully, we can see that there are layers in coral and shells. Once again, the thick layers indicate better growing conditions, the thin layers may mean adverse growing conditions. From this, we may be able to extrapolate information about the climate. I wish I took this picture. 
must be an exciting day when you have to put skis on an airplane and chase penguins off the runway. These pictures were taken by my friend Heidi Roop. She was working on the West Antarctic Ice Sheet in an ice core drilling project. Drilling down through the ice, we find that there are distinct layers. These layers relate to the depth of precipitation each year. By carefully examining trace chemicals and the thickness of the layers, we may extract climate information from long ice cores. The ice core extracted at the Waste Divide was over three kilometers long. I had a chance to see some of these ice layers when I was in Iceland examining this iceberg. You can see there are small bubbles, certain places in the ice and other places the ice is clear. The thickness of the layer relates to the precipitation. The darker areas indicate a stronger summer melt season, where the whiter layers indicate the winter precipitation. Going back through the layers of the ice, we may be able to extract climate information. A side note, you'll also notice that these bubbles are tiny pockets of trapped atmosphere. We can actually use these to determine the chemical composition of the Earth's atmosphere many years into the past. Another fascinating climate proxy are speleothems. These stalactites or stalagmites that grow inside caves are related to the precipitation in a certain area. This is Dr. Steve Burns from the University of Massachusetts. He studies the stalagmites and extracts the small samples from the different layers. After careful geochemical analysis, he can determine relationships between the thickness of the layer and the climate when the layer was formed. In fact, the climate information from that particular cave is indicated by the red line. This cave was on the tropical island called Sokotra off of the Horn of Africa. Dr. Burns has worked with some of the scientists who extracted an ice core from the Greenland ice sheet. I find it tremendously interesting in the similarities that the climate story seems to tell in these very different regions. Varves are seasonally layered lake and ocean sediments. The image on the left shows sediment layers from a glacial lake in New England. When there's a stronger melt season, that produced a thicker sediment layer. When it was a colder year and less melting occurred, the sediment was a much thinner layer. Similarly, in this picture on the right, we can see layers from a desert lake near the New Mexico-Texas border. In this case, the story of the layers is about how much evaporation took place in the warmer months. Fossils are also indicators of past environments. On the left, we see a small creature called a trilobite. It crawled across an ocean floor 360 million years ago. This ocean is now the state of Ohio. The picture on the right comes from Dinosaur National Monument in Utah. The environment must have been quite a bit different considering the size of the bones that are preserved in these rock layers. Some other fascinating fossil evidence includes these two samples of rocks that I found in West Virginia and Pennsylvania. This is the stump and impression of the bark from a tree fern. This particular tree fern was growing in tropical Australia, and the similarities in the pattern of the trunk and the pattern of the bark is unmistakable. Clearly, West Virginia and Pennsylvania must have had very different climates 300 million years ago when these plants were growing. Another dramatic type of proxy may be found in landforms. On the left, we see a picture from Yellowstone National Park. You'll notice that at the bottom of this valley is a river, and the valley is a distinct V-shape. In the Grand Tetons, a little ways to the south, we see a distinctly U-shaped valley. In the bottom of this valley is a glacier or snow and ice. Where there still is a lot of snow and ice, such as this location in Iceland, we can see that as the glaciers retreat and as the ice melts away, we're left with U-shaped valleys. At the base of those valleys, we also may see polished or occasionally what is called striated rock, rocks that have linear scratch marks on them. Finally, we may see moraines, 
Moraines are unsorted rock piles that occur when sediment is dropped as the glacier melts. Water has a tendency to organize rocks according to size. When glaciers melt, they leave the unsorted pile of rocks behind. So when we see a location such as this, with a large U-shaped valley, polished rocks, and an unsorted rock pile at the mouth of the valley, we can infer that there must have been ice that formed this valley many, many years ago. Finally, seafloor and lake sediments are tremendously useful for climate proxies. I had the opportunity to participate in the Lake Elgigitkin drilling project, where we drilled over 300 meters of lake sediment from this high Arctic lake in Northeast Russia. One of the things we looked at in the lake sediment was diatoms, small single-celled algae that have shells made out of silica, so they're completely resistant to decomposition. Understanding the different species and size of the diatoms preserved in the sediment can lead us to an understanding of what the lake temperature was. In the sample in the upper left, we can see that there are many diatoms. We infer from that that the Arctic lake must have been open at some point with well-circulated water. On the other hand, the sample on the right indicates very few diatoms. From this, we infer that the lake must have been completely frozen over, making it much more difficult for the algae to grow. In the lake sediment, we also can find the very durable material known as pollen, the genetic reproductive material from trees and other plants does not decompose. It becomes part of the sediment and may last for millions of years. We can see in this particular record, there's a time when there was an increase in tree pollen. This allows us to understand that there must have been trees growing around this Arctic lake 400,000 years ago. Some of the researchers at University of Massachusetts studied the sediment and saw sometimes the sediment was more of a greenish yellow and other times more of a bluish green. This change in color has been related to changes in temperature of the lake water years ago. An important thing with all the proxies is to understand that we won't just look at one. Let's zoom in at this long record of climate proxies to the more recent history. A very compelling story is found right in this area here, where we can see many of the proxies indicate that there was a distinct warming trend. When we can see a positive response in many different proxies, not just one, we have stronger confidence to understand that the climate must have been responding in a unique way at that time period. By examining proxy records from around the world, we've been able to reconstruct global climates. The red line indicates the current averages. Sometimes the climate has been distinctly warmer. Other times it's been distinctly colder than what we call normal today. From this video, I hope you understand that there's a wealth of information that goes into reconstructing global climates. And we have a pretty good idea what the climate was like thousands, hundreds of thousands, and millions, even billions of years ago. Thanks for watching, and I hope you join me again on another video.